All right, this is the first lecture of Parallel Programming with CUDA. Let's get started. In the first lecture, we're going to learn about the GPU threading model and how it differs from this idea of CPU thread. Next, we'll talk about the separation of memory spaces and how the GPU memory space is distinct from that of the CPU memory space, and we need to use different commands to interact with this memory space. We'll put those ideas together and create our first CUDA program, and then once we're done with that, we'll do a little review and then look ahead to what we'll learn in the future. Let's imagine we have a simple problem of needing to add together two vectors, a and b, to get a third. In serial, we would often write a loop, as shown here, where we loop over all 1,000 elements in the vector and simply, for each element, add up the two values and store into c. So in this case, we would take 1 and add it to 1 and store the result 2 into c. And we would repeat this for all of the indices in the vector. Now, if we were to parallelize this with CPU threads, we could add another thread and split the workload in half and have each thread deal with 500 values. And this would work fine if we had a dual core system. We happen to have a quad core system. We could split the problem into four parts and have each thread deal with 250 values. But this is about as far as it goes on the CPU. Maybe you have a six core processor, but you can't really go much farther. Each thread would still have a loop inside of it and loop over some range of values. <clears throat> the idea on the CPU is that you have about as many threads, <clears throat> excuse me, you have about as many threads as you have physical processors. On the GPU, the idea is different. Instead of tying the number of threads to the number of processors, we'll tie the number of threads to the amount of data. So in this case, it would look something like this. Each thread on the GPU would only do one item in the vector, one, one element. So it would, it would just pick one row here, add up A and B, and put the result in C for just one element. There would be no for loop inside each thread, and we would have 1,000 threads. And each thread would just do one simple thing. Now in this case, you can see that, you know, each thread has a different number or a different ID that it's solving the problem for. In this case, this thread is solving it for 49, this thread for 56, this thread for 58, and so on. So the threads have a way of identifying themselves so they know which, which row they should be working on. The main idea, again, is that the CPU, the number of threads, is related to the physical cores, and on the GPU, the number of threads is related to the amount of data that you're processing. This is a very key idea that you need to understand early on. The next idea that we need to talk about is the physical separation of the GPU and the CPU. The GPU is usually a separate card that plugs into a slot on the motherboard where the CPU resides. The CPU and the GPU talk to one another over a PCI Express interface. We can allocate memory on the CPU using a normal mallet call, and this will allocate memory for us in the RAM that's attached to the CPU. However, if we want to allocate memory in the RAM that's attached to the GPU on the other side of the PCI Express interface, we can't use a malloc call. We need to use a different call called CUDA malloc. This will allocate memory in the RAM that's attached to the GPU for us. Then the GPU can access this memory. If we try to give the GPU a pointer that had been allocated using malloc, then the GPU here would be trying to access memory over here on the other side of the PCI Express bus. And this generally doesn't work. In a more advanced course, we'll see that there is in fact a way to do this, but for now just assume that the separation is complete and the GPU cannot access memory allocated with malloc and the CPU cannot access memory allocated with CUDA malloc. So now that we have these two basic ideas, the concept of tying the threads to the amount of data and the idea of memory separation, we can think about writing our first trivial CUDA program. 
what do we want this program to do? Well, let's just get the number of threads we want to launch from the command line. We'll allocate some device memory. We'll launch a kernel. And all this kernel will do is have each thread save its ID to memory. And then we'll copy those IDs back to the CPU and print them out. All right. So CUDA programs generally have a .cu extension. So we'll call this program my first CUDA program, and then we'll give it a CU extension. Most text editors will now do syntax, syntax highlighting of .cu files for you. <clears throat> .cu files are very similar to C or C++ files, but they have a couple of, of extra extensions. So we start writing our program in the same way. We give it a main function, we give it a return value. Actually, we want to be able to accept arguments from the command line. So we'll say the number of threads is equal to the argument that we give it at the command line. We also need the C standard library for A2I. All right, now we know how many threads we want, so let's allocate some memory to store these threads. Well, the first thing we need is then a pointer to, let's say, we'll call it IDs. The usual notation is to prefix a pointer that will point to GPU or device memory with a D, so that it's easy to tell when reading code which memory space a pointer <coughs> points to. So and now we'll use CUDA malloc to allocate space at this pointer. How much space do we need to allocate? Well, we need one integer for every thread. Now notice also that for CUDA malloc, we pass it the address of the pointer so that its value can be modified by CUDA malloc. Now we need to write the kernel itself. So we do this with this keyword called global. The global function tells the compiler that this function will be executed on the GPU and called by the CPU. The return type of a global function is always void. We'll give the name to our kernel called save IDs and it will accept a pointer, call it IDs out. Now, what we want to do is get the thread ID that I mentioned earlier for every thread. And it turns out there's a built-in variable supplied by the compiler that contains this number. And it's called thread IDX. And it turns out this is actually a multi-dimensional variable. So for now, we will simply take the first component, we will treat everything as if it's one-dimensional. That's why we have this dot x right here. Next, we will simply save into the thread ID position its thread ID. If everything works, we should just get a list of 0 equals 0, 1 equals 1, and so on. And this is our entire kernel right here. We just get the thread ID, and we save into that location the value of the thread ID itself. So now we actually need to run the kernel, or launch the kernel, is the usual terminology. And we do that with a triple chevron notation, which is different from a normal function call. So here we're going to pass to the kernel a pointer to the GPU memory that we allocated previously, which is where it will save the results from this line right here. Now the one thing that we need to put in between the triple chevrons is basically how many threads we want. Now it's not quite as easy as just giving unfortunately one number, the number of threads that we would like. There's actually two numbers that need to go here. For now we will ignore the first number, in this case we'll just use one, and just put as the second number the number of threads that we want. It turns out the product of these two numbers is actually the total number of threads that gets launched. And in a later lecture, we'll talk about why there are two different numbers and what they're used for.
So now that we've launched the kernel, we need to copy the results back to the CPU so that we can print them out, since we can't read the device memory from the host. For example, if we tried something like printing the first value in the ID vector that we created, this will seg fault because on the host, this pointer doesn't mean anything. So let's allocate some host memory. And then use CUDA mem copy to copy the memory from the GPU to the CPU. So we tell CUDA mem copy. First, we tell it what the destination is. Then we tell it what the source is. Then we tell it how many bytes we want to copy. And finally, we tell it where do we want to copy from and to. In this case, we want to copy from the device to the host. Now that we've copied everything from the device to the host, we should be able to loop over the host array and then print out the values. And in this case, we'll simply print out the position in the array, followed by the value of that position in the array. Finally, we'll be good citizens and delete both the host and device memory that we allocated. In this case, just analog analogously to CUDA malloc, there's a CUDA free, which is similar to the normal free call, which will free memory that we allocated with CUDA malloc. All right, so now we should be able to compile this program with NVCC. NVCC is NVIDIA's compiler. And we use it the same way that we would use GCC. We tell it the output name of the executable. We tell it the input file. And then we let it compile. Looks like we've forgotten to include the IO stream to let us print. Once we do that, program works. We tell it we want 10 threads, and it works. It prints out the thread IDs of the, of the 10 threads, 0 through 9. We can try with 32, and again, it works. We get the 32 threads labeled between 0 and 31. Great. What happens if we go even bigger? 512, 512 thread. 1024, everything works fine. What about 2048? It looks like something has gone wrong. These numbers no longer match. We've no longer stored correctly the thread ID and at the right location. And it turns out this is because the kernel has failed, but because we haven't been doing any error checking, we don't actually know that. Um, so in the next lecture, we'll talk about both how to do error checking and why it has failed when we tried to launch uh, 2048 threads. So as a recap, a kernel is just a short function that is executed by every thread on the device. Um, usually when we say kernel, we really mean a global function. So a function preceded by that global keyword that tells the compiler this is a function that is launched on the GPU by the CPU. Um, for reference, a couple of restrictions that global functions have compared with normal functions. Um, as we talked about already, they can only access GPU memory with a small caveat. Um, they're not recursive. You can't recursively call these functions. They have to have a return type of void. It's unclear what it would mean if you had many threads and they were each trying to return a value, what value you should return from this function. So the problem is solved by having nothing returned from the function. Um, these functions also can't have static variables, and they can't have a variable number of arguments. Um, and finally, as we saw, thread IDX is a built-in variable that holds the ID of each thread. And also, for reference, C++ 
here are the function definitions for CUDA malloc, CUDA free, and CUDA mem copy that we used in our little programming exercise. Um, as we can see, CUDA malloc takes a pointer to a pointer, which is why we passed it the address of a pointer so that it could modify it and give us a pointer to the memory that it allocates. CUDA free simply takes a pointer, and CUDA mem copy again takes a pointer to the destination, a pointer to the source, the number of bytes to copy and the direction that we want to do the copy, from the host to the device, the device to the host, or even from the device to the device. Um, CUDA mem copy will wait until the copy is done before continuing. Um, later on, we might talk about some asynchronous ways to do mem copies. And it, of course, doesn't start copying until all the CUDA calls before it have completed, since we don't want a kernel to not have finished and memcopy to start copying results that haven't fully been written to yet. So in review, we talked about the threading model. We talked about the separation of memories and how to move data between them. We talked about how to create a simple kernel and call it and wrote an entire program that uh, calls, calls a CUDA kernel. And, um, Looking forward, we'll talk a bit about how to do some error handling with CUDA. We'll talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of this GPU threading model. We'll talk about how the threads are actually grouped into larger units, um, which will allow us, once we understand this, to launch an unlimited number of kernels. We'll be able to take advantage of both of those numbers between the triple chevrons instead of just, just the one of them that we did today. And we'll also start talking about the asynchronous nature of kernel launches. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and come back next time.